dopo sì, di questo. Sì, ma sono due cavolate, sì, sì. Okay, we can start. Michele heroically is going to teach during the Italy soccer match. This is the first time in history. <laughs> and we have the, the fifth lecture about the gravitational waves. <laughs> Thank you. So, if something happens, tell me, okay, if you see it on your phones. And, uh, so. <laughs> and you'll notice uh, it's casual Friday, okay, so I, I expect you to be relaxed. Um, so, we've been talking about data analysis and detection, so I, um, I'm inspired, I must say, by, by Shirley's interactive uh, lectures, so I, I, I wanted to do a little work, and we're, we're not, qu not quite at that level, but uh, I, I'm going to be asking you things, so, you know, please stay on the ball and respond. Okay, so, so I, I think you, you probably uh, got an idea of... Uh, um, how you look for gravitational waves in, in data, at least in uh, inter interferometric data. Um, but, um, so let, let's, let's try to write down a few keywords, let's say, a few buzzwords that uh, represent things that you need to do and that are important to do that. So what would you say? What, what are the important uh, concepts in, uh, in detecting gravitational waves and making sure you really see a weak signal in the midst of a lot of noise. Some words. Shout it. Yes, shout, just shout it out. Black holes, Black holes okay, yeah. Um, sure, that's the source, that's, that's what we've seen. Uh, I'm looking for things for how you see them, how you make sure that you've really, uh, uh, you've really seen a gravitational wave event. Yes. Say again, sorry? Strain. Okay, that's the physical quantity that we're, we're looking. Yes. Okay, so, there's, there's, this, uh, so, so that, that's a, the, the feature of the signal that you see, particularly not just seeing something that is periodic, but in that case you want to see a change in frequency. Okay, so we could say that then we're looking for something like uh, a, a shape, okay, a specific shape. Um, why does it help you to look for a specific shape? You can reject, right? You can reject everything that's not that shape. So, a noise in particular is kind of shapeless. It's random. You, you, you don't control the way it is. And we've seen this technique. Match filtering consists of, uh, by, by just a simple mathematical operation of correlation, which is basically multiplication, you can kind of tune, you can kind of select out the very part of the overall signal that looks like a gravitational wave and it's not, uh, um, it's not noise. So a more mathematical way than to say this could be that we're using orthogonality. Okay, so, um, and if we, if we do a little time frequency diagram, okay, there are different ways in which we could uh, use orthogonality. For instance, if we, we didn't speak too much, but uh, the one looks for bursts. Uh, burst of uh, um, gravitational wave bursts. In what sense are bursts orthogonal in the time frequency plane? They're localized in time, yeah. So, and if they're going to be maybe somewhat broadband, so a burst would look something like this. So you can write an algorithm that uses just this criterion, okay? So you're computing your time frequency diagram, your spectrum as, as you go, and uh, you're, you're going to look for excess of power for just bright spots. And if you get you know, a cluster of bright spots that uh, is, uh, has, uh, is localized in time, but not necessarily in frequency, that could be a candidate for a burst. Um, at the other opposite, okay, 90 degrees of it, um, one can look, say, for signals from a tumbling uh, neutron star in the galaxy, or from a neutron star that has some uh, uh, non-ellipsoidal, ellip non uh, actually symmetric uh, um, you know mountains on its spots 
So that, uh, that for that, you, you'd get uh, you know, a gravitational wave again at twice the rotation frequency of the Newton star. What would that look like in the time frequency uh, plane? Yes? Yeah, it would be a waveform. It would be a, a periodic signal, okay? It's essentially monochromatic, okay? Essentially pure quadruple. So it would kind of look like this. Uh, now, a chirp is the, the one we actually saw. It's more interesting. What does a chirp look like? A chirp like, looks like this. But in practice, so it's a little more complicated to get yourself orthogonal <laughs> to a signal that's curved, you know, in time frequency and so on. But basically, that's what it is. That's what match filtering is. And in all these cases, you know, we select something and everything else we try to throw away. So that's why it's called filtering. It's matched because you match the waveform, but it's still filtering. And by filtering, we mean removing something and zooming in on, on, on something else. So very qualitative picture, but, you know, keep, keep this in mind. Um, Okay, let's look for, an, uh, uh, for, for some other keywords. Apart from this, looking for signals and so on, what, what's important? What's, what has been important in this detection and actually has been necessary in claiming that it was, uh, the LIGO thing was actually seen and true? Yes? Noise. Uh, second, sorry, noise? Noise, noise, removal. noise removal, of course, yeah. Um, you want to build an experiment that's as much isolated from, uh, and you want to make sure that the noise is readable. Sure. So we'll call it, um, let's call it noise characterization, actually. Because some you can remove. If you cannot remove, you, uh, you need to understand it to characterize it. So that, for instance, when you have glitches, uh, you, can, uh, you can just toss out the data. Something else? Uh, the screen, please. Two detectors, right. So, uh, yeah, and that was the requirement. Anything that you see in a single one may be due to noise that you don't control. If you see it in two, it's, uh, you square, right, that probability. Uh, so I'm going to call this co coincidence. Okay, and there's a the last one that kind of goes with coincidence. Um, so say you see two things in two interferometers but the masses don't match. Actually, the search pipeline, the way it's implemented in LIGO, would actually reject that. That wouldn't be even come as a candidate. So let's call it consistency. OK, so um, I think between the four of these, we, it pretty much describes the uh, at least theoretical data analysis approach to, uh, to these signals. Um, two things that are a bit uh, uh, on the other side of this. Um, one is uh, this issue of uh, knowing in advance what you're looking for. Okay, so, so some have called it the problem of the expected versus the, as an unexpected. And you have a continuum, right, of possible searches. You can search for the things that uh, uh, you already know are there. Uh, and you can search for those very well if you know exactly what they're going to look, look like. But if you do that, you're, you're going to miss possibly the things you cannot imagine or the things that you don't know are in the data. You go to the other side um, and uh, you go to the other side and you don't know what you're looking for, right? You want to be surprised. Uh, so in some sense, you have to be less sensitive, okay? So and you... you at some point, the criterion for signal is something I can convince myself is not noise, and then can be a discovery. Um, so I, I, uh, that's the part that's most, most exciting. That's the part that would be also harder uh, to, hardest to achieve even. Uh, but, uh, let, you know, let's hope to be surprised at some point. And in astronomy, there were so many surprises. But in a sense, you know, you know when you see an astronomical source, right? They're all the little points of light. They're all, uh, <laughs> they're all bursts of photons and, and so on. Um, they're all localized and, 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 and so on. So um, even something you don't know in astronomy is uh, uh, it's usually clear that it's a signal. Although, you know, there's some, sometimes it can be a, a microwave oven. I uh, don't know if you, if you, if you follow the this, this story of uh, fast, ray bur fa fast radio bursts. Uh, fast radio bursts are, are the current uh, uh, right puzzle in radio astronomy. They're seen, uh, they, they come very fast, 
they're, they're, they're very short, they're very strong, they could be of cosmological origin, but the subpopulation of them, see, in Australia was traced down to the uh, microwave radiation from a, a microwave oven, uh, where people were opening the door too soon, right? Uh, it let you open, uh, when you open the door, it switched off the circuit, but there was some transient. So that's, uh, if you do that, if you, you know, when your popcorn is done, you just press on the, to open the door, you don't, you don't first say off, you're doing something wrong in, with regards to radio astronomy. Okay, so mm, what do I have here? Oh, the other thing I, I, I want to see, since we're just chatting, the, the other thing was a false alarm. Okay, so these two detections were seen with these incredible, incredibly small false alarm probabilities, uh, less than one in 600,000. And um, um, so that less than one in 600,000 years. Okay, well, way more than five sigma. If, uh, if you, actually no, that's five sigma. <laughs> but uh, e even more than that. I, I, I think that's very appropriate for, you know, a, a field and for detections where there were this, uh, this initial original scene in the 1960 of claiming something very big and finding out it wasn't true. Uh, but if in a year or two we are at the point where we're seeing, you know, a, a signal a week or 10 signals per week, uh, at that point, uh, the value of the individual detections is in, in that they build a population and that then you do an inference from the entire population about, say, your population of black holes and so on. So I would say that at that point, you could probably drop this false alarm requirement to something like uh, maybe 1%. Okay, and that, uh, that would be consistent with, with how things are in other uh, branches of astronomy or <laughs> of science generally. For instance, uh, even the Kepler, you know, the Kepler catalog of planets, there's some fraction there, probably, I don't know, probably more than 1%, but that, that are actually false, the, you know, false detections from uh, some, some kind of foreground uh, binary, for instance, and so on. And that's not a problem. It's a source of error in your population estimate, okay, but you can probably take it. So, um, so in a sense, uh, uh, um, this is prompted a bit. We were we were we were discussing the, this intermediate, this thing, this which is not quite an event, right? The LVT fifteen, ten, twelve, um, which has a ninety percent probability of being a, a um, an event. So, it's, right now, it's not worth a paper. It's not worth climbing, uh, claiming as a gold-plated um, event. But you know. In two years, if we have 110 are like that, you can probably throw them in and, and use their parameter estimation. Okay, so any comments on this? Yes. Okay, so, and uh, this slide was, uh, we talked a bit about you know, the match filtering algorithm and so on. These are kind of like the real world uh, um, aspects to it and how, how you, uh, this thing is actually implemented in reality. So of course the detector doesn't just give you a, a um, without, without lots of work, doesn't just give you H, the gravitational wave strain, you have to calibrate it, you have to condition it, then you do this filtering step where the filtering is, uh, is done by the correlation weighted by noise over a large bank of templates. Um, then you request coincidence and consistency, as we were saying. So you want to see the things happening in the two detector at the same time and that their amplitudes, uh, sky's position, masses are compatible. Uh, the, that's somewhat jargon, apply data quality cuts, but it means that uh, since you know the noise in the instrument, you've been monitoring all those other channels, magnetometers, seismometers, and so on. If you see that they are uh, turned on, they are excited, and you understand that there's a coupling based on your study, that there's a coupling between uh, the shaking of something and a possible uh, output, possible signal in, in, in strain, then you throw away that, uh, the data. Then there's the, 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 the step of estimating statistical significance, which is done with this empirical background estimate, the time shifts, and so on. And then there's a follow-up. Follow-up is actually a long checklist, which is probably something like 30 items or more, somewhat formalized, where you have a candidate, you know when it happened, and then you go through all the steps. Some are just trivial, you know. Um, the interferometer was in good operating mode. Uh, but there, there are lots of things to, to check, pieces of the experiment, uh, um, in, in inspections of, uh, I, I don't know, the way that the template bank was excited. So that, that's, a, at this time, it's a very human and, and time 
uh, consuming process, which probably took two months uh, after September, but it's, uh, it's what eventually leads you to claim detection. The other branch of that, get upper limit, was the what we had been doing for 15 years before this, uh, which is, uh, okay, you have some triggers, they're not, uh, um, they're not strong enough or convincing enough to be detections, uh, but what you do, you say, okay, that's what we saw, what's the highest level of, uh, the highest rate of these events that could be there and be consistent with these triggers. Um, so not a detection, but an upper limit. Okay, so let's move on a bit to parameter estimation. Um, so what is parameter estimation? You know you have seen something, you want to also see, you want to know what physics it has, so what physical parameter it contains. And parameter estimation is basically uh, the idea that you have a variety of different shapes. You have a parameterized family of waveforms. Okay? In this case, it's a simple burst. The simple burst has just uh, um, two, three parameters, really. There's a, but, but I'm going to fix the amplitude. So it has a, a frequency, and it has a characteristic damping time. So now uh, we're given uh, noisy data. Actually, we're convinced that it contains a burst like that because we saw it in a burst search, time frequency search. And now we want to see, we want to know what the parameters of the signal are. Yes? The, the what, sorry? The yes. The, the, the five plots? Yes. Oh, so, so those were the same, away from in the same family? change in the value of those parameters along the two. Uh, so so I, I think that's what you asked, right? So just here? Yeah. Okay, so, oh, yeah, I didn't say it. So, so that's, uh, this, this is a, 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 a burst, a, a sine Gaussian burst, technically, of the, the form up there. So it's a sine multiplied by a, a, just a squared uh, uh, exponential. And now uh, let's, at the middle, let's just, I just picked some central parameters. And now what happens? If, if we move, if you change the, uh, the frequency going up, right, increase the frequency, that's the way that it changes the waveform. If you, if you go down, it changes in the other direction, and so, so. And the same for the damping time in, in the other direction. So you, you should imagine this as a continuous family, of course, right? You can change it a little bit, and then you get to that level. Uh, but just to say, um, and the, uh, the effect of the parameters on the waveform, in general, are going to be correlated. Right? So, so sometimes uh, uh, it, when you look at the shape, um, you'll be able to, to absorb some of the, uh, the change in, uh, in one of the parameters with another one and get the same signal, roughly. Right? Not here, though. These are pretty orthogonal. Okay, so, so again, to, to just the question. So you, you're given that noisy signal, it contains a burst. How do, you know, how do you know which of these shapes it contains? Again, you do subtraction, right? Because I, I can only do a subtraction, addition, subtraction, and multiplication in, in, this, in my simple data analysis. And you just ask, so those are residuals. Those are the signal minus the uh, putative, uh, you know, true signals that are going to be in there. So which one is it? You can actually, you can't really tell by eye, but, <laughs> but what you do is just you see which one of those has the smallest squared integral, the smallest power. We're working with Y noise again here. So all frequency come in equally. So it's actually the one at the middle. Okay, it's the least noisy. Um, and uh, the, actually if you, if, you, if you really do this game, uh, you don't quite get the right one. Okay, so uh, the, um, the, this procedure, in the, I actually did it here for that simple signal. So I, I, I injected this red, sine Gaussian into noise, and then I tried out, I optimized the, the match, the match filter, or the subtraction over all possible sine Gaussians uh, for, uh, around it in terms of parameters. And the blue one is the one that, maximize, that minimizes the residual. But it's not quite the true one. So why, why is this? Paolo cannot answer. It's, uh, your you're not, you're not in the school. <laughs> it's, very, it's very simple. I, I, maybe I'm, I'm using confusing, you know, confusing language, but it's, it's actually very simple. Why, why, yes? On the detector threshold. Uh, 
but sure, yeah, I mean, the signal is not hugely strong, but uh, why am I getting the wrong parameters? Yes? What is the error? Uh, yeah, so, so sure, okay. Uh, uh, that's a little more complicated to do, so let, let me do it next. But uh, sure, there's an error, but the point is there's an error. Okay, so there's an uncertainty. Yes? Discretization? Uh, n no, I actually did it continuously. So you could have that when you, if you do just a template bank and uh, simpler, just think simpler. I mean, I, I, I'm, I must have confused you. <laughs> there's noise, right? So there's noise. It's a noisy signal. So some of that noise will look like one of the signal will look like actually will look like the difference of one of the signal. We're projecting the our, our um, yeah. Let, let's show it like that. So let's be very abstract and let's say that we work on the manifold of this family of signals. So there are two coordinates here: this alpha and this f. And now every point on this manifold represents one of those signals. Okay, is this, this clear enough? So I can take a point like that and it becomes one, one thing like that. Now, what is, uh, this is a two-dimensional manifold, but that signal that I measured there, the output of the detector, is a point in a much larger space. You can imagine a space of all possible signals that are, you know, eight seconds long, and so it's, uh, I don't know, the, the sampling time is, uh, let's say, is 4K, so that's going to be, for by, it's going to be 32,000 points to describe that. So that, that's a much larger space. Uh, it's, it's going to be R, right? It's roughly R32,000. The important thing is that uh, my, uh, this manifold of signals, the pure ones, the perfect one, is embedded in this larger one because all of these shapes are a point there. What is the measurement? The thing that I measured is one of these plus noise. Okay, so noise moves me away from this manifold of perfect signals. And then when I, I maximize, I minimize the residual, what is that in this kind of uh, geometric representation? It's projection. It's right, it's literally projection down to the signal. So I make an error. Why is this error? Because uh, the, the noise that was added has a component that's tangential to this manifold of known sh signal shapes. So there's, you, you will always get that, okay? You, it'll be smaller and smaller if the signal is very, very strong and noise just does, does a little bit. But noise, since uh, uh, you know, it comes in all frequencies, it can affect all the points, will always a little look like a, a true signal and will give me an error in the parameters. Um, another way to look at this is that uh, since there's noise, we're going to be overfitting uh, the problem. Good. So uh, this, is, this is the intuitive picture of uh, parameter estimation. There's really not much else to it. Uh, it gets a little more complicated in practice because as I was showing you, uh, the noise curve of the detectors is, is not flat. There's a, there's a band of good, uh, uh, good uh, sensitivity, which means that, for instance, if, uh, and I told you that uh, on the high frequency side, usually noise comes from uh, how well you can sense the position of your test masses. And the low frequency side, it, it comes from uh, um, just the, um, the fundamental you know, motion, Brownian motion, of, or, or perturbations on, on, the, on the state of the, your reference masses. So sensing and acceleration. Uh, now, since it looks like that, um, things are a little more complicated than what I showed you. So for instance, if uh, I take this, the same realization of noise for Lisa, so this is kind of, those must be days, I don't know, I, I don't know if they're seconds, and I put three different signals in the same noise. Those signals actually all have the same amplitude as gravitational waves. But you can tell that uh, one of them is going to be easier to see than the other two, because the second row down there, I'm taking just the, the Fourier transform, of uh, signal and noise, and you see that in, in two of them, the signal is kind of immersed 
in, in the noise. So the fluctuations of noise are going to, uh, to be able to obscure the signal or to confuse it. But if you're in the middle, um, I don't know what I, this noise is not quite a curve like that. I probably did something more square because you see the, the Fourier, Fourier transform just goes to zero, <laughs> stays zero and then goes up again. But anyway, the signal in the middle is the one that's going to, to have a, uh, to be a better contrast and a higher SNR. And yeah, I even show it, I guess, with those uh, uh, rounded dots up there, that it's a little bit above the noise. Okay, so there's a quantitative way in which you plot, uh, you can plot the uh, the strength of a signal with respect to noise, uh, which re lets you read off the SNR from just that kind of uh, sensitivity plot. So we need to reflect this uh, this aspect that noise is frequency dependent in the kind of uh, uh, data analysis we do, so we cannot quite just do a simple subtraction, uh, but you need to do some weighting, okay? And uh, um, so, and to do the weighting, you need to understand your noise. So, um, the spectrum, at least in our business, is the main characterization of noise. So, uh, the, the idea of noise that one needs to assume is pretty... Uh, basic and idealized that noise is a Gaussian process. It's, a, it's actually colored Gaussian noise. Um, so let's try to then write the probability distribution for it. Where did I put my eraser? Yeah, maybe. So if I have a Gaussian random variable, let's call it uh, x, <laughs> what, what, what is the probability distribution for the variable? It's, yeah, shout it. It's a Gaussian, sure, so p of x. <laughs> you need to know what it is though. Okay, so it's some kind of normalization. Actually, we could even write it uh, two pi sigma squared e to the minus x squared. Okay, now uh, we're going to make this a little more complicated. Um, if I, yeah, so if I, if, I, um, if I draw, if I sample one of these every second, okay, and they're all the same, and I do it for n, uh, big n seconds, what is the probability distribution of the entire time series? Uh, yeah, the time series of uh, drawing one random variable every second for n seconds. What is the probability distribution of all of them at once? Yes. Yeah. So, um, so since we're smart, we're just going to do it uh, at exponent directly, right? Something like that. And uh, you can even generalize it, and then, okay, this becomes uh, 2n, I guess. You could, uh, and, uh, you could even generalize it and let each of them have a different variance, if you want, okay? Although you'd have to fix this normalization thing and put a multiplication there, but uh, no worries. Okay, so let's get uh, more sophisticated. Let's go to the frequency domain, okay? We can do a frequency domain version of this, and let's ask, uh, we're going to describe this sample signal, xi, for i going from 1 to n, in the frequency domain as uh, the probability of the, uh, let's call it the x tilde, okay? So these now are the frequency domain components of the same signal. So then uh, what does the probability distribution look like in the frequency domain? Gaussian again, okay, so it's a need to something. And what do I put up here? I have that, okay. So it's going to be, uh, so you, you, you think about Fourier transform, there's something called Parsifal's theorem. Right, it roughly tells you that the square, a sum of squares in the time domain is the same as time squares in the frequency domain. So it's going to look like something like this. Uh, 
and again, some, some normalization factor here. Okay, so they're really similar. Um, but the interesting thing is that uh, um, if, I'm, uh, if I'm describing noise that is red, okay, so that is at low frequency goes up with, the, um, uh, with, with lower frequency goes up, what does that look like in terms of uh, just the samples? So red noise looks like something like a slow random walk. Okay. So a slow random walk like that, that's what is very correlated, one would say. So if I tell you what the value of my sample was here, I can tell you almost exactly what it is at the next step. This kind of description cannot represent a random, a random a set of random variables like that because these are all uncorrelated, okay? There's a product of probabilities, you can do them one by one, and they all don't know about their neighbor. Instead, this kind of behavior is represented very well in the frequency domain. You have to make a strong assumption, which is technically stationarity, so that the kind of like the, the random process l keeps looking like, looks like itself, also at, at, uh, as, as time goes by. Um, but the way you describe something like this is simply by changing this PI and making it large, for low frequencies, for the Fourier components at low frequencies, and making it smaller for high frequencies. If we look at the very blue okay, spectrum, you go to the other side, that gives me a very fast uh, oscillation. This thing would not be very correlated on short time scales. And again, you'd see it like this. You see that a lot of the power is concentrated in these fast fluctuations. Okay, so I'm making, uh, I'm getting there a little slowly, um, but the point is that we're, we're there almost. This quantity here is analog, you see, to the variance in the time domain. So this is actually just the power spectrum. Okay, so the power spectrum density, yes? How, how correct is it to think about how, how, how correct it is in reality? Yeah. That's a great question, so, <laughs> and m many answers to that. One is uh, you can go to the experimentalist and you can tell them you need to do the best job possible in giving me noise that Gaussian. In, uh, um, and there are obvious things that they can do wrong they will give you noise that on Gaussian. For instance, if you're saturating a measurement, right, a photodiode, if, if you introduce some kind of transducer that's not quite in the linear range but becomes nonlinear, well, at the output of it, you're going to lose the Gaussianity of it. Uh, of what you have. So that's one thing you can say, <laughs> throwing the problem to the experimentalists. Um, then another answer is that I don't care because Gaussian is the only thing I can do computations with. Okay, so that's a, that's a very field theory, theoretical, I'm joking, it's not. It's a, a, that's, a, um, that, that, that's, a, that's a good answer in a sense because uh, it means, however, that you have to be careful. Okay, so you're going to proceed with what you have uh, to do calculations, and you're going to remember that it's only true in some idealized sense, and that you need to keep checking yourself. So these things, consistency, or all those things, uh, um, coincidence, consistency, and uh, what was the other one? And well, okay, data quality, data cuts, all those details are because of this. If you really believe that your noise was Gaussian, you wouldn't need any of those. You could do just a single experiment, and then uh, when you see something that's strong enough, you know that, uh, you know that this is right. Probability of false alarm. And if this is right, once a scenario is 20, there's no question, you don't need to lie, goes, okay? The, the probability of getting it wrong is infinitesimally small. But since it's not, <laughs> uh, you, you, you have to be more careful. And in practice, when, when one does that empirical estimation of background, uh, you should see a distribution like that, right? Those triggers just due to noise should go down in log-log space exponentially, but the, there is some tail. Okay, and that means that the theoretical instrument that you use is not quite, uh, doesn't quite re respect reality, and you need to, to do more, to do more to. So best question ever of the day, at least. So very, very well done. So where were we? Here. Okay, so then uh, we're down to that formula. 
Okay, so the, the probability of noise is a product of those uh, exponential Gaussian uh, forms, okay, uh, fun exponentials for, uh, for the noise components in the Fourier domain. You can turn that into an integral, and that S there is just the power spectral density, which, which is what I can measure from the experiment. I can also try to uh, predict it based on all the physics that I have. Short noise, thermal noise, uh, seismic noise at very low frequencies. Um, the good th in practice, you know, that integral is not hugely sensitive to what you, you do. If you get it a little wrong, also because you're doing all these checks and so on, you more or less do the right thing. But, so that's perhaps the central, the central formula. This P of N is the central formula of, uh, um, of all my business, all, all our business in gravitational wave parameter estimation because, um, because now I know what the probability of noise is. That means um, that from this, I can also derive a probability of the signal. Because what I measure is equal to whatever gravitational wave signal is in there, plus noise. So that means that the probability of a certain h to be in here, so the probability of a signal h, gw, given s, this, the data, let's say, in LIGO, is equal to what? To a probability of noise LIGO equals S minus H. Or again, the subtraction that I was showing you. So, um, actually today, I, I don't know if I'm being <laughs> so trivial that I bore you or very profound, sorry, okay. Maybe, you know, if you really think about it, it's profound. Uh, and therefore, it is going to be proportional to e to the minus, uh, um, again, s minus h, s minus h over 2. Um, you can look at this as the likelihood of the, um, oof, I wrote this backwards, or oh, the Bayesians are going to be, kill me. So this is the probability of observing the data given the presence of a certain signal. Okay, so this is like a likelihood, the likelihood of the data. But I can turn it around using Bayes' theorem because uh, what I really want is the probability of my vector of uh, parameters that describe the signal given the data that I have observed. Okay? Uh, we use the law of compound probabilities. So let me multiply this by the probability of observing the data that I have actually observed. This is a little confusing to think about because after all I saw it but there is an a priori probability of seeing it. And you can turn this around and write it as S given the uh, parameters times the probabilities of those parameters occurring. And now I'll take this and put it under here. I think I have this in the next slide, actually. Um, and this piece is just what we derived. So this is based on the probability of noise being given by the difference of data minus the the model, effectively. And what is this piece here? So who's familiar with Bayesian inference in this audience? Heard about it, at least. Just one? Come on. <laughs> Three? Yes. That would be the prior. OK. So um, why do you need this? You need this because, say, uh, say you're estimating the um, you're estimating, you, you see a, a, a gamma ray burst, and you see also a gravitational wave there. Okay, so it's going to be a binary of two neutron stars. Let's say we're in two years, so this is, this is our business. Uh, maybe you start doing this game, and you estimate that the most likely parameters for uh, the, the two masses are three and 1.4, or three and two. So should you believe that? Is that an acceptable response? Well, it may be a new discovery that you find a, an overweight neutral star or so on, but probably um, if, if, you, if you really assume that they're only, they're only neutral stars, probably just the noise projected onto the signal in such a way that it made it look like it was a heavier black hole. But you should be able to use that information that neutral stars only come with smaller masses. That's in a probabilistic sense where it goes in, okay, in this kind of prior. What's another prior? Another, uh, in gravitational observations, you may have priors on certainly the masses. 
although we don't really know very much about the binaries, so it's, uh, you, you don't want to put too much in there. That's really what we want to discover from uh, what we understand the gravitational waves. Uh, how about the prior and distance? Okay. So what's a good prior for the distance of, uh, of binaries? What's the simplest one? The simplest reasonable one? I think we're here at Earth, you know, solar system. <laughs> uh, you look at, yes. Say again, sorry? 100 megaparsec. That's one value, okay? So that's a likely possible value. But what I want to know is uh, uh, I'm expecting to see a, a number of uh, uh, binaries. Um, what, and I'm going to, when I get them, okay, let's say we're, we have godly powers and we will know exactly where they are. Uh, they're going to have some distribution in distance, okay? I want to make a histogram here. What will it look like? Say, say again? No, I'm sorry. Let's, let's pass this back. This one. Yeah. I don't know if we do something or if they're just, they just see, they see us and then they turn it on. That my, must be how it is. Yes. Poisson distribution. Poisson. Poisson. Yeah. Poisson distribution. Poisson distribution is what you get in time, okay, for something that, uh, that happens. It's, it's, it's the correct answer if we're doing the prior for T. Okay, for, for, actually, not quite T, for the number of, of events you get in a, de in a definitely event. But I'm looking at distance. Okay, so what's a. Try again. <laughs> you get a second, <laughs> second try. Yes? Exponential. Exponential. Uh, why, may I ask? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sure. Uh, that, that's, uh, because the galaxy looks like, uh, uh, what does it look? So minus uh, rho squared uh, sine uh, hz, something like that, right? Good answer, except we, we see much, much farther than that. Yes. Right. Um, that kind of takes into account detection already. So which... Uh, um, you don't usually need to do one unless you're working really at the edge. But yes, but, uh, uh, um, but just a little simpler than that, okay? So let's say, uh, you're, you're going to see, we, we look far enough that the universe is homogeneous. After, after all, we're all cosmologists. I'm not, but you are, right, at the School of Cosmology. So uh, if we don't look too far, actually, cosmology is Euclidean, right? So just R squared, right? They're just on spherical shells. Uh, if you're going to include cosmology, okay, you apply cosmological, uh, so you do your transverse distance and, and, uh, and so on, so, but it, it does go up like that. But it's true that if then you can apply a, uh, um, you can apply a detection, uh, basically a, a selection effect, or, or, uh, and, and then this thing will, will go down eventually because they get too far to be seen, so that's correct. So these are all, the, it's all information that we have before we even look at the details of the, uh, um, we look at the details of the experiment. Some of it may be information that doesn't even come from the strain from the gravitational wave effect. So for instance, if we see a counterpart, we see some lines, I don't know what, uh, um, uh, what's a good line in a GRB, but uh, um, you may get the redshift. Okay, and the redshift is interesting because it gives you some of the same information as in the luminosity distance if you fix your cosmology, or it actually lets you, uh, if, 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 you, if you have a great detection, you could even throw in you know, your cosmological parameters and solve for those as well from this because we have a redshift and a distance. So application of, of this to cosmology. So all this information goes into a prior. The prior goes into building uh, this posterior probability for my parameter given the data. Okay, so what is, what is this formula? Bayes' theorem, okay? It's Bayes' theorem. Uh, Bayes' theorem is one of these cases of, you know, taking the credit, maybe a little too much, because Laplace had that already. Probably Bernoulli even. The, the early uh, people who were studying probability 
could do a compound probability like that. Uh, Bayes kind of brought more, uh, a little more philosophy to it. The idea, uh, and really the interpretation. So it's not so much that he had the theorem. His idea was, you know something already. That's a prior. You have some knowledge of the, um, you have some knowledge of the, um, the universe or some physical system, but then you observe it, and your observation lets you update okay, your prior knowledge to a posterior knowledge. That's why it's prior and posterior, okay, before and after. The ingredient in between is the likelihood, okay, which is an expression of uh, the probability, the relative probability of the data as a function of your source parameters uh, given your model. The, the real Bayesians always had uh, like, like a, a suffix here, comma i or comma m, uh, to point in, in all of these probabilities, to point out that all of this is within a model. Okay, you're, you're, and that model is an additional assumption that uh, may even come with its own probability. You may be working with multiple models, give each of them a different probability, and, and uh, so state your assumptions, right? But uh, I, we almost never write it because it's, uh, one has a model that they like, and yes? Okay, so that's a very good question. So this P of S is uh, known as the evidence or the marginal likelihood, or it's marginal because I can actually write this as something else. It's there on the screen also, but what is this P of S? It's actually the integral of the numerator over all possible, did I put? Yeah, over all possible values of the parameters. So, what does this tell me? In terms of estimating the parameters, so finding like the distribution of this posterior, it doesn't really tell me much uh, because it's just one number, so it's just a normalization. So if I can just compute this, uh, then I know the, you know, I know where the peaks in parameter space is, where uh, how parameters are correlated with each other, and uh, I, I, I don't have much use for the evidence here. I can compute it. To that you add uh, the fact that it's usually very, very hard to compute this integral because usually we have a large number of parameters and uh, it's, it's hard to uh, explore them in a way that gives me an a, um, accurate uh, evidence. However, the evidence is kind of interesting if you're considering multiple models. Okay, so you may say, for instance, you may say we're analyzing the uh, posterior parameter distributions for any spiral of two black holes in general relativity, and we do the same job for any spiral of two black holes in a massive theory of gravity, in a massive graviton theory of gravity. Okay, so those two things you do separately, but for each of them you can compute the evidence, and then you can compare those two evidences. And that compare, that's called model comparison. You're comparing two different uh, explanations of the data that you observe and possibly two different uh, sets of priors. Okay? And those two numbers, those two evidences are uh, directly comparable. So you take a ratio, you call it the Bayes ratio or a Knotts ratio, and it would tell you whether one of the two models is preferred with respect to the other one. The problem with that, you know, we, we were talking with that uh, at lunch <laughs> with Shirley, is that nobody really knows what the number means. So the a ratio, a ratio of two posteriors. So you look at some of these books on uh, probability and inference, and they tell you, okay, if it's one, the ratio is one, then neither model is preferred by the data. Okay, that's reasonable. If it's five, one of the model is moderately preferred. If it's 50, one of the model is strongly preferred. But those are just labels that this, uh, the, you know, the, this statistician who wrote the book chose to put there. Uh, they don't really mean much unless, uh, uh, unless you know, for instance, uh, how likely those models were, uh, were in advance. And in physics, that, that's really, really difficult to, to do. Um, in a book, in a textbook, you could come up with little experiments like saying, uh, okay, I have 10 coins. One of these coins is, uh, um, is 
the trick coin that comes out heads all the time. Okay, now I pick a coin at random. Uh, I, I flip it five times. I get all heads. Okay, so now I'm going to do model comparison, right? <laughs> For the uh, probability, the um, I should do something more complicated if I have to have some parameters there, but I, I can do model comparison and I can come up with a ratio that tells me how much more likely one is, is than the other one. Okay, if you control everything like this, and if in particular you know that one out of 10 was a trick coin, then you can give a more interesting statistical value to this base ratio. It will tell you something, um, it will tell you something about if you do this game, a hundred times, it will tell you how many times you were right. Not quite the ratio, but you, you can work it out from that. In nature, uh, I don't know, I think we have only one universe, although the, the landscape people tell me differently. So uh, in nature, what odds ratio are you going to give to Einstein's GR compared to a massive graviton theory? It's, it's an impossible question, right? It's, I, I would give it actually very good, very good odds on GR compared to, to, just because it's so pretty. And, uh, and it's been confirmed to a part in, you know, 10 to the 13 in many aspects and so on. Um, for that reason, you know, this is something that people compute, but it, it's, it's hard to interpret and, unless it's huge or very small. Okay, 437, that means I have still 25 minutes, okay. So um, I will skip this. this uh, I had a, a, a very nice, I think, a historical uh, presentation of, uh, of Mont Marco Che Monte Carlo, which is the way that in practice we do all this parameter estimation, that we do the exploration of these, the posteriors and the livelihoods over many parameters. Um, I will tell you that the name Monte Carlo comes actually from a solitaire because uh, Ulam in 1946 was sick at home and was playing solitaire and he came with this idea that uh, he, he couldn't win, so he wanted to compute what was the probability of winning at this particular game. And it was too complicated, right? It involved too much uh, combinatorics and so on. So he actually came up with the idea of uh, one of these new computers, how about we program it to just play solitaire many times, 100 times, 1,000 times, and then, uh, um, and then empirically figure out what the probability is for winning. Okay, so that was the original idea. He went to, he told von Neumann about it, and von Neumann t said, oh, we can do something, we can do nuclear physics with it, okay? We can, we can do reflection, and uh, uh, there were Los Alamos. Then, um, who's that guy? <laughs> Looking very grim, I must say. Is, uh, anybody? Nicholas? Metropolis, okay? So that's uh, Nicholas Metropolis was a computer builder at Los Alamos back then, and he had built this thing called the Maniac. And these guys are Rosenbluth and Teller, and they wrote this super famous paper in 1953. This is the, the birth of the Metropolis uh, algorithm, uh, where the idea is, uh, uh, and it's, uh, the paper is nice because it's, um, uh, there are two Tellers and uh, two Rosenbluths in here. So there, there are two husbands and wives in the, in the byline. Um, and Metropolis, uh, I think, mostly you know, gave them a computer, although he's the first author. But, um, anyway, the, the idea to this paper is Markov chain Monte Carlo, not just Monte Carlo. The idea that you're sampling a statistical distribution, something like e to the minus uh, e over kt, that's very hard to do if you're just drawing random samples, random states, because most of them will end up having small energies and therefore they're not very useful in the distribution. So the turn here was how about we draw the states already with the right probability? Well, that's the hard thing, but the genius was to come up with a, um, to come up with a, a, a stochastic way, a, a randomized way to, to generate states according to a certain statistical distribution, which is the Metropolis algorithm, which involves proposing a state and choosing it based on a, reg, on a rule, the Metropolis rule. And uh, let me skip this, why this work, but this is the way we explore parameter distributions in, in GR. There are so many parameters, we cannot afford to look al along all axes for multiple values. We do wander randomly in, uh, in parameter space, but we try to do it as, as smartly as possible. We use we, this Marco Che Monte Carlo methods, which are random walks, uh, guided in such a way that they realize the probability distribution you need 
and uh, uh, that's always, uh, that I think is, is awesome because it means that statistical physics solves the mathematical problem. Um, and it does so in a way that's independent of the number of dimensions, but in practice, it ends up being slow all the time. You can never do it, uh, if you just do it naively, it can never work well enough. So there are lots of complications and lots of sophisticated uh, variants on it. For instance, Hamiltonian Marco Cioè Monte Carlo is a very uh, useful one and a very uh, smart one where you're kind of, you're not ju just doing a random walk anymore, but you have effectively a, uh, uh, Hamiltonian motion. So you're solving the, the Hamiltonian equation of motion, giving some random kicks, and that leads your walk to be much more useful. Um, but I'm pointing out here two, two algorithms and software packages that have been all the rage in the last few years. One is this MC, uh, so it's an uh, affine invariant sampler, um, and one is Multinest. Okay, so that, that's, these are used actually in LIGO, in the LIGO business. A fine invariant is, uh, um, is an, an idea to avoid having problems basically with units of things. Often in your parameterizations, um, you know, the, the units, the, the distances in, in parameters, parameter space, are not quite commensurate with the real distances in, in signal space. Uh, so you have a problem because you're moving too slowly along one dimension and you're moving too rapidly along the other one and, and you, you, you end up having very losing precision. These affine invariant samples have a way of kind of like being invariant with respect to affine transformation, right? So scaling and, multi and, and rotations in parameter space, so that makes them powerful. Multinest is not quite Markov chain. It's, it's another technique that uh, is especially, um, was especially devised to, to compute the evidence, in fact. Uh, and that, but it's still, it's still a, 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 a randomized uh, stochastic technique that involves throwing numbers randomly in, in, in space. Okay, so last 10 minutes about testing GR uh, with gravitational waves. Um, so I, I, I think th this is a place where there's a, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a gap between, I would say, the field theory and the theories of gravity and what we can actually do in, uh, in experiment and NGR. And I think that we're still working with a very classical framework in terms of testing GR, uh, which is the DKI. DKI framework uh, discussed especially, especially, way by, uh, especially way by Cliff Will in uh, uh, his uh, book. There's a, a, a green and a yellow version. I don't know which one is newer. But the idea is you start with Newton's equivalence principle, okay, that the inertial and gravitational mass are the same. Um, and you extend that, that's tested incredibly well, okay? On the Earth, we know it's true to one part in a lot. Um, to make GR, Einstein extended it by adding invariance principles. So local Lorentz invariance and also position invariance. If you get that, um, you, you pretty much have to have a metric theory. A metric theory is one in which small particles, test particles, move along geodesics. So it's a theory in which you have the equivalence of free fall and uh, uh, acceleration of um, apparent accelerations and gravity. And also it's a theory where locally, if you're in free fall, the old, uh, um, the old uh, special relativistic physics works in, as is with the same equations. Okay, you can take Maxwell's equations, write them in a local freely falling frame without changing them at all. And then if you want to you know, use different coordinates, you, you transform them and you do general covariance. But otherwise, locally, you know, freely falling physics looks non-gravitational at all. Um, you go a little stronger, however. You, you, you get to the strong equivalence principle, which is the statement that not just all masses fall in the same way, not just all forms of energy, such as you know, the energy of the electromagnetic field falls in the same way, but also gravitational energy also falls, like, um, falls freely. Okay? That's harder to test, and that's a very strong uh, statement, actually, that is, I think, realized only by GR among the, uh, the classical theories of gravity. It's tested to a part in 10 to the 4 with the laser ranging of the moon, okay, of the reflectors that the astronauts left to the moon. So Dickey's idea to test GR was then uh, you test these basic invariance principles, and then uh, you build on top of that metric theories that uh, uh, all achieve the, 
um, all achieve the same Newtonian limit, because we know that Newtonian physics is correct in the limit of small velocity and small gravitational fields, uh, but then are different at the next order. So you build what's known a parametrized post-Newtonian formalism, which is Newton plus some potentials with, with a, a small number of free constants. Uh, with, with that, the invariance that you have assumed and with the assumption of uh, metric theories, uh, this is the only way that you, you, you can do it, okay? And you come up with this PPN, has a number of parameters uh, that you can measure. Then you can devise experiment to measure because they give you uh, predictions, for instance, for the bang, bending of light around a, a mass or for the gravitational redshift or for uh, what's the, the other big one, or for the motion or in, uh, for the precession of motion in, uh, um, a, a around uh, the sun, for instance. And these parameters, gamma and beta, are the ones that are usually the, are the most interesting because they tell, you, um, they tell you how much curvature is produced by mass, and they tell you about the nonlinearity of the gravitational field. The other one do break some symmetry in a sense because they give you preferred directions or preferred positions, um, and it's... Um, they're a little less interesting because we like invariance. So now the problem is that uh, you, you know, general relativity is tested by verifying that these parameters have almost, or to, 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 a, to a small uh, error, just the values predicted by, uh, by Einstein. Um, and now, once in 19, what was it, 78 and so on, they actually observed the change of the period of uh, the binary pulsar that killed essentially all the metric theories that were different from GR. Because most of those either don't uh, pre predict gravitational waves, they have it in the wrong form. Um, actually, I'm saying quite something a little... Um, little different here. So I should say gravitational radiation is predicting virtually any surviving, okay, metric theory, given the quadruple formula that embodies Lorentz invariance. Uh, there are a few characteristics there of, that are um, just special to radiation, okay? They're, you don't see them in the post-Newtonian uh, potentials because they're not about the dynamics of bodies. They're, they're about the propagation of waves and the generation of waves. Um, so, for instance, you may expect to have different polarization, a different speed, and a, a different effect, a different loss of energy, um, different shape, shape in that. The problem is that people were not able to, nobody has been able so far to build the equivalent of PPN, or parameterized post-Newtonian, for uh, gravitational waves, effectively. They, uh, not, not a principled framework like that. So, the tests that we can do are either against a completely different theory, of which we don't have very many that are viable, or the kind of test of consistency of GR uh, with respect to itself. So you can test how well it predicts the fact that you see, but you don't know whether the, the difference, if there's any, is, exp is explainable by something else. Okay, and so, um, yeah, it's uh, Copeland, right? Uh, it's a riff on that. Uh, these are all tests that you can do just on the shape of the signal that you observe without having to assume anything about, uh, um, about an alternative theory of gravity. So you can take different pieces of the waveform and, and compare them. You can see whether you, after you've taken out, subtracted out from the data, the best fit that you have, you have something left. Um, you can see whether the, you know, the shape, the likelihood shape of is, is what you expect also. Um, and these are all things that we can do, and, uh, and we, we've done several of them. I'm going to show you the one that I like the best. Okay, this was in this paper, Test of Relativity with W1509. And so what was done here is uh, uh, to take, again, the best fit waveform in the family of uh, spiraling binaries with spin that were used to, to estimate the parameters, take it out of the data, and then what's left should be just noise. Actually, it should be noise less a little bit, which is the overfitting bit, right, that was mapped into signal. But that should be only noise. And then we took that residual and we ran another search on it, a search for a coherent signal or a coherent residual in it. This couldn't be any spiral because, after all, you've taken out the spiral. You don't expect 
in spiral minus in spiral is not a spiral. <laughs> so, but we ran a burst search for a signal that you know was roughly uh, was signal-like, had the right polarizations. In, I had the same polarization in both detectors and, and had some kind of uh, coherence in frequency. And uh, that search actually came up with uh, an SNR of seven. Okay, so the residual could be mapped into a burst of SNR of seven. So it sounds like a lot, but that plot there, that histogram, shows you what happens, what SNR you get if you do this burst search over just uh, lots of noise-only realizations. So you get seven just out of noise. Seven is pretty typical. Uh, then what you can do is to say, however, let's say that this, uh, uh, this burst that I've reconstructed for noise actually represent the error that I made in my template, in, in my signal. So that it's entirely due to a violation of GR. That's what left there, it looks coherent. Maybe I could think up of a theory that actually changes the shape of my spiral in that direction. Um, so then the, the nice thing that we realized and that I, I, I especially advocated for is that then what you can do uh, is you can compute this thing called a fitting factor. Fitting factor is just a single number between zero and one that describes how well uh, two signals look like each other effectively. And by knowing that the, the actual detected signal has a, had a signal to noise of 23 and that this coherent residual had a, an SNR of seven, you can say that the, the, the match effectively the inner product of the two signal was greater than 96. That means then that you've confirmed GR using the full prediction of the waveform to 4%. Okay? And in a sense, it's the best that you can do with that signal. And it's a test that it's entirely, it doesn't depend on any other model of gravity and that uses the full information. So um, since I like this very much, does it make sense to you? Do you have questions about this? Or it is some, yes. Oh, yeah. The case of no metric theory. Yeah, no metric theory, yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> so um, I saw this. if there's small violations with respect to GR, you know, it, it would still look like GR with some anomalies and so on. I mean, but otherwise, I, 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 so a nomadic theory, for instance, could be a mond, right? This can, this kind of, uh, so I, or, or Tevez, or, or so all of those things tend to to have the conservative dynamics sector somewhat mapped out, but they don't necessarily, for instance, have a wave equation. Or so I, I don't think that there's any that has a prediction at, at this point that, that can be compared to this. Or as, so partly I know very little, but partly I know that uh, uh, nobody's coming to us with <laughs> waveforms from, from a nomadic theory that we can, uh, we can compare. So um, are we still tie? tie? Uh, no, no, the, the game. Zero, zero? For, for one, zero? No, no, wait, for, wait. for whom? Yeah. For Italy? Yeah. Oh, good, good. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> okay, let's, let's go on. Let's okay, go. so I, I, have a, I have almost no time left, but the, these are things that, so, so go see that paper. That's, that's a, it's, a, it's a good paper. It's, it's the first one of its kind, so, he, you know, he has some failings and some things that are less interesting than others, but I, I think it's, a, it's a very, very interesting. It does attempt to do all this classical basic tests, polarization, speed, and radiation reaction. And um, polarization, oops, polarization would be, I told you I think on, on Tuesday that uh, in, if you don't impose quite the uh, Einstein's equation, in principle you can have six polarization in, in the waves, uh, the two tensor spin two transverse ones, but also two scalar effects, one transverse and one longitudinal and one vector. So we tried to see whether we could uh, test the, the, con the polarization content of this signal, and you cannot because you have only two detectors that are aligned. So they only see one projection, in effect. Um, so for instance, we you, you can do a test and you say if the wave was entirely scalar, uh, 
uh, with the same uh, phasing, but was in Thales scala, which is, is not possible to do in any serious, th in any reasonable theory, but say, then uh, uh, you could not distinguish that from having the actual, uh, you, you, the actual two polarizations. Some things would be different, position in the sky would be different, and so on. But, um, so we need a network even to do this, okay? We need Virgo at the beginning of next year, we need Kagra eventually. Uh, mass of the graviton is something you can do. Gravitons should not have mass, but if they do, they will change the velocity of gravitational waves, which will be less than the speed of light. Um, actually, I was a little mind blown yesterday talking to Stefano Liberati because he was telling me that in, in most interesting theories, the speed is greater. Speed of gravity is, is greater than the speed of light. And therefore, you have two cones and so on. So, so that's not something we could we checked here. Uh, but if you do that, you modify the dispersion relations, so the velocity as a function of the energy, and that gives you uh, a, a dephasing, right? So this uh, gravitational wave, uh, this chirp, you, in frequency, you can see it as a frequency domain expansion, just as sum of components at different frequencies. Now, so each one of those are, are, is going to have a slightly different uh, velocity. So that means with respect to, what I, uh, to, to, to the GR solution, the, those components are going to be, to be shifted a little bit, and that's going to change the phasing of the signal. So you can do that by doing this big exercise and adding one more parameter for the graviton mass or for the wavelength, and you end up uh, uh, bounding it. So that's the posterior probability distribution for it to, to very small values, less than 10 to the minus 22 eigen um, electron volts. Okay, so then uh, finally, testing radiation reaction. Well, this, this does actually a little more. It tests the entire shape. Uh, um, no, it tests radiation reaction and the conservative effects, dynamics effect in the binary at the same time. By doing this, uh, our waveform model looks like that, okay? It's a sum in frequency space of powers of frequency, some logarithm with the, uh, many um, coefficients that are computed in post-Newtonian theory, right? The ones that, that I showed you, and some coefficients that are actually fit to numerical relativity waveforms. So that entire waveform there is parametrized by physical parameters. The masses, the spins, uh, all real things. So if you fix those, there's only one waveform, okay, that you can do. The idea here was, uh, okay, how about we take those coefficients and one by one, we let them free. So all the other ones follow the, the shape that they should have in GR, but one of them uh, is allowed to vary, and we're going to estimate it with everything else. So you add that to the parameter set. Um, so it's a somewhat formal exercise, because uh, if you do that, you don't necessarily reproduce any alternative theory of gravity. Although you, for some values, you can. Some of those coefficients you would get, for instance, with the... Uh, um, I don't know, so some of these helicity, um, uh, what, what are those things uh, called? Uh, um, some of these string motivated uh, modifications of GR that have a scalar field. Some of those do give you an additional term, an additional power. But anyway, that's, the, uh, um, that's what you get for the individual parameters, where zero is the general relativity value, and the, uh, the violin plots there show you where you bound them around it from the, actually both signals, both the September signal and the December, the Christmas signal. So, you know, the interesting th thing there is zero PN is what? Zero PN is the leading order loss of energy to the gravitational, to the quadruple formula. So you're doing that to maybe 10%. It's not as good as the binary pulsar, okay? Because that's been going for 15 years and it's, it's time very precisely. This one is, a, is only 55 si five cycle or eight cycles. However, the 1 PN and 1.5 PN are, are tested to about 10%. Okay, so that's already a correction to GR on the order of V over C squared and V over C cubed. That's, uh, uh, that's tested in a strong velocity regime, and that's a, that's a, new, a new finding. Okay, that's a, that's a new test. Uh, for comparison, this was the, uh, what, what you do there. Okay, so I got to the end, and we said this rotating. And um, thanks so much for bearing through this week. I, I, I gave you only a small piece of it, but I gave you the parts that I like the best, so they're probably the most entertaining ones. Lots of good books, reviews, and so on. And uh, I think if you look just at this detection paper and companion papers, um, 
they, they try to cite the best, you know, the best papers and the best references for all the various aspects. So that there were big fights over what to cite and what not. So they're a very good place to start a bibliographic uh, search if you need to. And that, that's what I do now, actually. Where when I want to see something, I say, okay, what did we cite for, for that paper? So um, enjoy your weekend, you know, your travel back. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we could be here this week. It was awesome for me. <laughs>